We come to lecture two, which we started last week, and we'll probably get into lecture three. There are 13 lectures. They won't line up exactly with the 13 weeks of the class, but we'll probably get into lecture three, which will be a, a, a big one, church and state. So we'll get it all figured out. But here we are on defining the church. We went through various names for the church. The two Hebrew words, kahal and adha, meaning assembly, gathering, congregation. Two New Testament words, ecclesia, gathering, church, synagogue, to meet together. And then various metaphors, buildings, bodies, and brides, families, farms, fullness, Man, that is really good. And we just looked at five expressions of the church in the New Testament. Local church, a group of churches. Number three, churches represented by rulers and office bearers. Four, the church throughout the world. And five, all those in heaven and on earth united to Christ. So we want to talk about the contrasting nature of the church in Bannerman goes into some of it, it, it is helpful. Hopefully you've already made good progress in Bannerman. Keep reading through that. At various points, my, my notes follow closely with Bannerman, so I try to reinforce what he's doing. He has such a clear outline. And he talks about several of these contrasting pairs. Bavink does, Burkhoff does. Just trying to help us understand what is the nature of the church. And we'll look at each of these very quickly. So number one, the church as militant and triumphant. So this distinction speaks to the church as God's people. On the one hand, we must fight, travail here on earth. At the same time, there is a church in heaven gathered in glorified rest and repose. That means the church must be at the same time at war against sin, the flesh, and the devil, while also enjoying the Sabbath rest one for us in Christ. Sometimes people will, you, you'll find different pastors pulling in one way or another. Do they, even as they preach, do they conceive of the church as an army or a hospital? And this metaphor, militant and triumphant, helps us to understand it. It needs to be both. And when you only think of the church as an army, you might be very good at winning souls or combating the rot in our world. But you need to realize that people come to church and they're weary. They're weary of their sins and they need comfort and help. By the same token, if you only conceive of the church as a hospital and it's only a place that you, you come just to recover and you assume that everyone who comes on Sunday is just so beat up for their sins, and they just feel just miserable about their sins. You know what? Lots of people in church on Sunday have not thought anything about their sins, and they actually need you to, by God's grace, expose those sins and then lead them to Christ. So militant and triumphant. A second pair you'll be familiar with the church as visible and invisible. Visible and invisible. This refers not to two different churches, as if we can say, you know what, I'd like to just be a member of the invisible church and not the visible church. No, the distinction draws our attention to the church as she is visible and the church as she is called to be invisible. The distinction is a contrast in some sense between an outward external relationship to Christ and the church in an internal spiritual relationship to Christ heard this before. It, invisible is it's all of the elect who are joined to Christ, and the visible is what you can see. The distinction is also used at times to describe the professing church we see on earth compared to the church of the elect that is in heaven and on earth. One of the things that, uh, remember, I hadn't put it together before until reading Bavink years ago, is we're familiar with visible and invisible, simple enough on the face of it, but he says part of what it, it's meaning to do is to give us a sense of faith and, and hope that the visible church, it's easy to find all the faults and all the criticisms that are warranted and justified for the visible church. But our notion of the invisible church is not just what's in heaven and we're secretly belonging there, but it tells us what the church is 
supposed to be, and indeed, by faith, how we conceive of the church. So just as you, as a Christian, have a certain positional relationship with Christ, positionally, you're justified, you're fully holy, and yet we grow into that, so we need to conceive of ourselves corporately in that same way. Often we think, well, simul justus et peccator, that's really good for me as a Christian, that I'm a sinner and I'm justified, but the church of Jesus Christ, would you just see all these sins as if we would be surprised that the church has sin? Because it has sinners. Of course, we don't excuse the church's sins any more than we excuse our sins. But visible and invisible helps us understand the church is growing into this reality which it already has in Christ. Third, and there's five of these, so third, the church is Catholic, small c, we'll come back to that, and local. That means the church is universal on the one hand, and on the other, the church finds tangible expression among an identifiable group of people. God does not give us the option of just belonging to the church Catholic without belonging to a local church. Fourth, the church is organism and organization. So you hear church, some people think buildings, budgets, the formal structure of the church, and they need to be reminded that the church is a living, breathing, growing organism. At the same time, there are certain folks who only want to think of the church as that organism, and where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of us. We'll come back to that passage, which doesn't mean that if you have two people praying at a park bench that there you have the church that two or three are gathered. Matthew 18 is in the context of doing church discipline. So it's about uh, agreeing in this matter of church discipline. Uh, Church is not plural for Christian. Some people think of it that way. You got more than one Christian, ah, you have a church. No, the church is an organism, but it's also an organization. It has structure, it has officers, it has doctrine, it has rights, it has order to it. And then fifth, the church is gathered and scattered. What the church looks like on Sunday in a specific time and place, that's the church gathered, but the church doesn't disappear after the last benediction on Sunday, only to reappear then in another week. The church exists as believers spread abroad in their homes, in their workplaces, in their communities. This, too, is a very important distinction because when people talk about all the things they want the church to do or to be or to fall under the auspices of the the church and its leaders and its budget, they're often only thinking of the church gathered. This relates very much, we'll maybe get to this morning, to the mission of the church. Well, I have a calling to go redeem Hollywood and to make movies that speak of the good and the true and the beautiful and amen you've got that calling to go do that and yet people come and say well i want this to be a ministry of the church or can can you announce this uh you know christian screen screen actors guild that i want to start and can you give some of this in the church budget i hope you'd say brother sister it's a wonderful calling and sense of purpose. But as the church gathered, there are certain things we do on Sunday morning, movies not being one of them. There are certain things under the institutional auspices of the church that we support, namely to make disciples and baptize them and teach them. This is the church scattered. Sometimes I've heard people say as a kind of barb against the church, They'll say, if your church completely disappeared, would anybody in the community notice? It's a fine question to ask, but often the assumption is that the church just means if your church meeting in this space disappeared and no longer was there, no longer has Sunday services, would, would your church would anyone notice? And often the, the force behind that question is, are you doing enough in your community? Are you providing social services for people in your community? Are you providing whatever, I don't know, blood drives, food trucks, all sorts of things? 
maybe a, a blood drive in a food truck would be a new thing. <laughs> so you are making a real difference in your community. And it tends to push people toward an expansive notion of the mission of the church. But you need to think not, that's only to think of the church gathered. What is the church gathered doing? You have to think, well, of course, of course, the 200 people in our local church, if they just poofed, were raptured because the Presbyterians were wrong about that doctrine and it happened and they're gone, whether the building that stands empty there on Sunday morning made a difference, certainly those 200 people gone are doing something in their communities. They're, they're nurses, they're teachers, they pay taxes, they bring up pie to the neighbor when they move in next door, they're working to volunteer at the hospital, to school, all sorts of things. So we need to think of the church as scattered throughout the work. The church doesn't cease to exist between Sundays. Many mistakes in the church are the result of celebrating one half of these pairs at the expense of the others. So we need both sides, lest we become unrealistic about what the church will be or skeptical about what Christ says she is. So the church is bigger than where you are. We need to know that. But you need to belong to the church where you are. The church is more than an institution, but it's not less. The church, some of you have read this book, the church is both trellis and vine, coming from some of our, our Australian friends, and we've used that book in our church. And then there's a follow-up, The Vine Project. Uh, it's a very helpful metaphor. You know what a trellis is, this kind of lattice work that is in the garden and allows a vine to grow. Well, you need in the church both trellis and vine, so for the vine to grow, you need some, some structure, some order. But the goal is not to say, everyone come, look at it. That's the most beautiful trellis, isn't it? Let's all compare our trelli, our trellises with one another. And it's just a helpful metaphorical distinction for you in the church because there are people who have trellis gifts and people who have vine gifts and you need both, but you need to keep in mind the vine is, is the goal. Not to mean the people who are good at organization and administration, but sometimes churches get lopsided and they have 80% of their members just maintaining a beautiful trellis with lots of committees and organization and institution and everything in the church is running really smoothly. Wow, we must be doing great work. But there's no, no vine. There's no people coming to Christ or people growing in Christ. It's just a very elaborate trellis. So we need these two pairs of these five distinctions. The church militant and triumphant, visible and invisible, Catholic and local, organism and organization, gathered and scattered. It keeps us hopeful and also realistic. Any questions there? We're going to go down to attributes. Attributes of the church. You already know these from the Nicene Creed. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. One holy, Catholic, apostolic church. So the attributes of the church, number one, be unity. So one we, we, we think about the attributes of God, of course. They describe the godness of God, but fewer Christians consider the attributes of the church. Unity, holiness, Catholicity, and apostolicity. So, first one, because God is one, the church is one. John 17, 11, diverse in many ways. 1 Corinthians 12, we're bound together in one body, each member doing its part. The dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile has broken down. And you know that unity in the church is so important. Jesus made it his central theme in his high priestly prayer in John 17, that they may be one. 
we call the Lord's Prayer the Lord's Prayer, but you could almost call that the disciples' prayer because it's the disciples saying, teach us to pray, and he's, here's what you should do. You could call John 17 the Lord's Prayer. That's his prayer to the Father for the church. The unity of the church is not primarily external, but internal and spiritual in character. That is to say, the presence of many congregations or even many denominations is not necessarily a violation of one church. I know there are fine Reformed folks who lean more in the, you know, denominations are automatically a sign of the church's failure in some sense. And John Frame, whom, Frame, whom we've all benefited from, leans more in that direction. Certainly some denominations were schismatic and shouldn't have existed. And yet I would argue not all of our divisions, so-called, are schismatic. There are divisions in the church caused by language, by culture, by location. That is to say, to look at the various denominations. Certainly, there's, it can, it's easy to say, well, there's too many of them. Can't all of these split peas, these Presbyterian groups, do they all, can some of them come together? But when you trace out the history, you realize that some come from Ireland or Scotland or other Reformed traditions from the Netherlands or at various times, there are local disagreements that then get multiplied in time, and some of those are unfortunate, and some of those are just the nature of different immigrant groups coming at different times. So the existence of many different churches and many different denominations, I don't think automatically means the church has lost this mark of unity. The oneness of the church depends upon the other three attributes, that is, the church also being holy, Catholic, and apostolic. That's what, where our unity comes from. So just take what would be a common division, even in this room, Baptists and Presbyterians. We disagree on important things. And yet I don't think that means automatically we, we don't have unity, though it's not in a formal denominational sense. We can recognize a sense of spiritual camaraderie, having the most important things in common. Sometimes one of the apologies on the, the Catholic side, Roman Catholic, is Protestantism is by definition divisive and schismatic. Look at, look at all you Protestants. This is what happens when you don't have a pope, you don't have a magisterium, you have limitless division. If only you could... Look at the Roman Catholic Church, we're still really one. Well, it, if you follow any Roman Catholic theologians or blogs or journals, you realize they have just as many, if not more, disagreements within the Catholic Church as Protestants have within the Protestant Church. Uh, now, they would say, yes, but we still are all together under one pope. Well, one pope that some of you think is really good and some of you think is terrible. That seems like a strange kind of unity to have. So if we understand that unity, though the external unity is not unimportant, if we understand that unity is more importantly spiritual, then I would argue that there is no less unity among Bible-believing Protestants than there is in the Catholic Church. Okay, that sounds like a nice Protestant apologetic. What's some support for that? Well, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, we know there is, if you turn there for just a moment, Paul's famous description. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There is a lot there about the oneness and the unity of the church. 
And it's based on that shared oneness that he issues the command in verses 1 and 2. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Maintain the unity of the Spirit. All true Christians at all times and in all places share in one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. That's the essential unity of the church. And what Paul is telling, remember Ephesians, dividing wall of hostility, he's thinking about divisions between Gentiles and Jews. You might transpose it to our time and differences between Asians, Hispanics, whites, blacks, difference between generations difference between political alignments. He's saying, so long as you are truly one faith, one Lord, one spirit, one baptism, you have that spiritual essential unity. His command, therefore, is to manifest that in some sense of relational unity. So that's verse 2 and 3. Be patient with one another. Bear with one another. There is no unity of the Spirit apart from a shared allegiance to our one Lord Jesus Christ, our shared commitment to our one faith. If we do not share, for example, one faith, and I think here one faith is not just a belief in Jesus Christ, but one faith delivered for the saints. Now, that doesn't mean every jot and tittle of the Westminster Confession, but I think it means the apostolic deposit of faith. We don't share basic apostolic orthodoxy, then you don't have unity. You can still be, we should still be nice to one another, but we don't have, I would argue, unity in this Ephesians 4 sense with Mormons, with Unitarians, I would say even with theological liberals, not the same one faith. I think Machen was right, Christianity and Liberalism, as you've often heard, the most important word in that title is the word and. It's not a variety of Christianity, but it is something different from historic Orthodox Christianity. So the diversity, to use a popular word, which can mean something good and can mean something nefarious, the diversity that we're after is not theological diversity. Theological diversity that exists among Christians, that is a result of living in a fallen world and seeing through a glass darkly and the finitude of our own knowledge. And we'll all have the the seminars in heaven that will get us all aligned. So we're not after theological diversity per se. Wow, isn't it great? We just, we, we don't agree on the doctrines of the faith. That's our goal as a church. We just love it. We all see it so differently. No, there will be some doctrines we simply have to agree to disagree. The goal is not that kind of diversity. What Paul is saying in Ephesus is, look, there are historic, ethnic, cultural differences, but you have deep, essential, spiritual realities in common. So unity is something true Orthodox Christians have in Christ, something we strive to maintain in the church, something we grow into now and in the future. That's the point. If you turn the page to verse 13, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God's mature manhood. So on the one hand, we share one faith, one Lord, one baptism. In verse 13, at the same time, we know that we're still growing. We're still learning this one faith, this unity of faith. So unity of faith is something we can have and something we can also mature in and grow into. We shouldn't be afraid as evangelicals, conservative, reformed Christians to think unity. Now, I know some, you know, you can get traumatized. I was in a a more liberal denomination, the RCA, and I tell you, I you know, get a little twitch when somebody up front at the Synod would talk about unity. You're like, oh, no, we, I know here. So once, when the, once the guy gets the unity thing 
the unity bat, he's ready to just say, stop making a big deal about biblical marriage. Stop making a big deal about doctrine, you and your confession. So I, I know, you can get triggered. It's the unity is the thing that the liberals do. No, no, no. Let's, let's, unity is the Bible's thing. It's one of the four attributes of the church. We have to understand what this unity entails. And without getting too far afield, you may know that there are some people uh, arguing now that if we're really true to our natural selves, naturally we need to find camaraderie and oneness with people who are culturally like us, ethnically like us, and we shouldn't expect the church to have a kind of ethnic um, multiplicity. I'm, I'm thinking of some of Stephen Wolfe's argument in his book on Christian nationalism. I think Ephesians 4 points us in the exact opposite direction. We have a unity and a spiritual oneness that is deeper than those ethnic peculiarities. Of course, there are realities of uh, speaking of different languages and living in different parts of a, of a city. And it is an, a natural human impulse. Birds of a feather flock together. That happens. But Ephesians 4 is telling us against our own nature, as it were, you need to see that there are deeper, more fundamental realities true about you as an Orthodox Christian and other Orthodox Christians that help to bring unity where people would not normally expect to see any. So the goal in a church is not diversity per se. I've said before, sort of trying to provoke a little bit, there's just as much diversity in hell as there is in heaven. So the goal is not just to look and say, whoo, diversity. Yep, hell's got that too. What makes diversity something praiseworthy is the unity that comes out of diversity. That, that's heaven. Wow, these people who don't have the same language, they're different tribes, they're different ethnicities, they have no earthly business being together, but they are fundamentally one in the most important reality in the universe, namely worshiping Jesus Christ. The unity of the church. Second, the holiness of the church. One holy church. As I said a moment ago, the holiness of the church is both a present positional reality and an ideal for which we, we must labor and toil. So in one sense, the church already is holy. How could we not? We're the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, God's own treasured possession. Once we were not a people, now we are a people. So despite our many failings and sins, Ephesians 2, 21 and 22, we're still a holy temple in the Lord being built together. So the, the holiness of the church is who we are. It's also who we are called to be. 1 Peter 1, 16, be holy as, as I am holy. So Christ gave himself up to save us from the penalty of sin. That means we're holy, but he also died to save us from the power of sin, which means we're growing into this holiness. Under this attribute, sometimes you have the word, just such a great term, the indefectibility of the church. That means God's holy church will, it, it ultimately is unable to fail. That's a great thing. Now, churches close, pastors sin, ministries fold up shop, but you all are, are training to be engaged in the one institution on earth that we know will last for all time. There's no other institution that Christ himself promised to build. He didn't promise to build the PCA or RTS or RUF. Uh, he promised to build the church. So you are laboring to be a part of this, which is 
indefectible. This does not mean that the church cannot act in ways repugnant to its own nature or that the visible church in some location cannot be snuffed out by persecution or by unfaithfulness. But the church scattered across the globe cannot fail. Nations will come and go. Great men will rise and fall. Powerful institutions wax and wane. But the church will not fail. Her perpetuity is guaranteed by Christ himself. This is part of the holiness of the church. It ultimately will not fail. Third, unity, holiness, Catholicity, uh, as Protestant pastor, I have lost track of how many times congregant, and it's fine, I understand, has asked me after we've re recited the Apostles' Creed in worship, I don't get it. Why do we profess we believe in one holy Catholic church? In fact, pastors, before you start ministry, let me you just advise you to get in your head, two responses as you're shaking people's hands. You need like a 20-second response to each one. Because if you do the Apostles' Creed, I guarantee somebody's going to say, Hey, Pastor, why do we say Catholic? I, I don't like, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and, and then I started doing this, and this weirded me out. Other thing you're going to get is, descended into hell? Should we be saying that? What does that mean? So get in your head a 20-second response to both of those, and then you can say, uh, why don't you sign up for a class at RTS, and then you can, or here's a book. So why Catholic? I think you understand that Catholic simply means universal. Greek word, katholikos, meaning general, universal, pertaining to the whole. So we are not confessing our faith in the Roman Catholic Church, in fact, as a Protestant, I would argue that Roman Catholic is a contradiction in terms. If you're talking about Catholic, universal, now you're saying, no, well, the universal church that, of course, is bound to this one particular pontiff at one place. To, to put a geographical or bishopric next to that is a contradiction in terms. When we think of the church's Catholicity, we can think of it in four ways. So one, universal with respect to place. So the church is not limited to one specific location. Wherever believers worship God in spirit and in truth, there are Christians, invisible church, and then the visible church with ordinances and officers, the church scattered across the globe, and we belong to this universal church that's rejoicing in heaven. So Catholic, it's not confined to one place. So it's Catholic with respect to places, Catholic with respect to persons. So the church is a global body, worshipers from tribe, language, peoples, nations. It's not restricted to any race or ethnicity, sex or social standing. It is universal with respect to times, so diffused across cultural, geographic barriers, but also diffused across centuries. Part of a church that has existed since the beginning of the world, if you think of the church as God's people gathered together, and will exist until the consummation of all things. And then it is Catholic or universal with respect to truth. The word Catholic, even the Greek word, katholikos, not found in the New Testament, but was used often by the church fathers to distinguish the church which was bound to the apostles' teaching from various other sects, S-E-C-T-S, and groups. Now, historians will tell you that that was nice that they got to call themselves the Catholic Church, and more cynical historians would say, well, that's just what the winners called themselves, and they get to be Catholic, and the other ones get to be heretics. And there are those historical exigencies that we need to admit. And yet, 
It is true that there is and has been one apostolic deposit of truth which has marked out the church across time and place and centuries. Catholic does not mean we're in allegiance to a certain hierarchy. It means we have an allegiance to the faith delivered once for all for the saints. This idea of Catholicity means that racism, for example, must be rejected, the denial of the Catholicity of the faith to prefer one set of persons over another. It also means that church growth strategies, which aim, according to the homogenous unit principle, to only attract and only build with certain kinds of people cut across this Catholicity of the church. Catholicity can be threatened when national concerns become confused as necessarily Christian concerns. I do believe patriotism is a proper virtue, and I don't pretend to be a global citizen. I'm, I'm, I'm an American. I have a passport from the United States of America, and I think that uh, we ought to care about the country in which we live and serve and minister. But as a pastor, I must not lead my people on Sunday morning in saying, praying, or singing things that we would only believe as Americans and not in common with Christians in Poland or Japan or Mexico or wherever. I don't pretend that you know, there's a language that's understood by people in this place. There's, there's a context. There's ways of doing things. So it's not some sort of ecclesiastical Esperanto, you know that term that people tried to invent this Esperanto language that nobody spoke but would just be that everybody could speak and it never caught on. So there's no just sort of transcultural uh, church culture that just dropped down from the heavens. We all inhabit a certain people in place. We don't apologize for that. And yet... The Catholicity of the church means, as well as the regulative principle of the church, we'll come to later in the course, that on Sunday shouldn't be leading people, for example, to pledge allegiance to the flag. Uh, it may be appropriate in a, in a school in America, but how, that's not a, there's, there's no biblical command, quite the contrary, that all God's people must pledge allegiance to the American flag. You can't lead your people to, to do that on Sunday. Uh, where you draw the line in a church and certain appropriate patriotic expressions, uh, thanking God for freedoms in your country, praying for, for servicemen and women, all of that can be appropriate. And yet we must never be leading in such a way that a brother or sister from some other country who's there has to just, well, I keep my mouth shut here. I can't really do this act in your service because I'm not required as, you know, an Indian or a Sri Lankan or a Mexican to, to do this. Perhaps the greatest threat to the church's Catholicity is theological error. Now, to be sure, the church has made plenty of doctrinal and ethical mistakes in history, and yet, if we trust the work of the Spirit across the centuries, at least our default, at least our default should be to trust what the church across all times and all places has believed. For example, when churches move to bless same-sex unions or perform so-called gay marriages, they not only presume to know more than any Christian communion has ever known prior to the second half of the 20th century, they also do great harm to the Catholicity of the church. If the church in the West really believes in one holy Catholic apostolic church, it will cease to undermine doctrinal commitments that have been held by all Christians at all times in all places until like five minutes ago. One holy Catholic and then finally, apostolic church. We've already talked about this. Apostolicity does not refer to the apostolic succession of bishops, but to an apostolic succession of truth. The New Testament is infinitely more concerned that the church remain fixed to the gospel handed down by the apostles 
than with some hierarchy of ecclesiastical bishops descended from Peter. In the very beginning, Acts 2.42, the church devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching. Ephesians 2.20, the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So all throughout the New Testament, we see this in particular in the, epistle, uh, in the pastoral epistles, there is this core apostolic deposit. To deviate from it is to be outside the bounds of the church. Your role as a pastor, in part, is to take that and to hand it down. That's, that's the, the Latin root of the word tradition, means to hand something down. That's why you see the similarity with the word traitor, was somebody during persecution who handed over Bibles or scriptures, and they were a traitor. Tradition is to hand down. So we may be innovative, we may be creative in certain ministry approaches, but our goal is not doctrinal innovation. If you want to be a doctrinal innovator, I suggest you do something else. Our role is to take what has been received and pass it on to the next generation, to pass on this tradition, always testing it against Scripture, of course. But it is this apostolic, this unchanging message that must be proclaimed by the church and passed on. Four attributes of the church. Questions before we keep moving on. Names, nature, attributes, the marks of the church. Sometimes called the the notes of the church. We often hear the, the marks of the church. What, how do we distinguish the true church from a false church? The marks of the church became necessary because of the proliferation of heresies and different kinds of faiths that went under the term Christian. So think of this as disagreements between Catholics and Protestants, which it is, but... This existed long before that, from the very beginning of the church. It just had to try to determine, well, how do we know a true church from a false church? We are then, we are talking about the being of the church here, not just its well-being, its, its essay not just as bene essay, it, it, it's, it's essence. What, what is necessary for the church to be the church? This is important to keep in mind because some people more recently look at the traditional marks of the church and they say, well, you're, but you're missing the uh, mission. Mission should be a mark of the church. Well, we're not trying to catalog everything the church ought to do. The church ought to pray and disciple and love one another and do a hundred other things. We're talking about those things without which the church is not even the church. And don't get confused either. Uh, Nine Marks Ministry, they're using marks more broadly really as this somewhat a combination, but more the Bene essay. uh, what, what, What do churches look like that reflect the character of God? That's what they're thinking. We're talking more technically about these marks. Here's what Bannerman says, page 62. The difference between, quote, things for which the church was instituted and the things that have been instituted for the church. Things for which the church was instituted and things that have been instituted for the church. What does he mean? Well, things for which the church was instituted... Say Christ, uh, the church, 1 Timothy 3.15, is a pillar and ground of truth. What, on the other hand, was instituted for the church? Bannerman says, well, Christ gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry. What is the church instituted for? What was instituted for the church? Roman Catholics multiplied marks of the church. So Cardinal Bellarmine, for example, during the Reformation, 
listed these as the marks of the church. The name Catholic, antiquity, uninterrupted duration, multitude of believers, succession of bishops, agreement with ancient church, union with Christ the head, sanctity of doctrine, efficacy of doctrine, holiness of life, glory of miracles, right of prophecy, confession of adversaries, end of church's adversaries, temporal felicity. You can read Turretin if you want to have him go through each of those. Uh, you don't have to use your imagination to see how many of those are, are getting at you Protestants. You're not ancient. You haven't been around very long, which is why the response of the Reformers was always, no, w we didn't just get invented either. We want Augustine. We trace ourselves back to the very beginning. We think that your church has become corrupted. So because of this proliferation of Catholic marks of the church, it became incumbent upon Protestants, and we can zero in on Reformed theologians to think about, well, what do we consider the marks of the church? And for, surprisingly, such an important topic, there is not entire agreement, even among Reformed theologians, as to the marks of the church. Though I think, as we'll see in a moment, even their differences may be more semantic, but some would say there are three marks of the church. What would, what would be the three marks of the church? I bet you know. Does anyone give me one of them? Of the yep, so preaching of the word. What else? Sacraments and, and church discipline. So the right preaching of the word and the right administration of the sacraments and the right exercise of church discipline. Ursinus, Heidegger, not the later philosopher, the Belgic Confession talks about these three marks. Then there are some say there are two marks, which would be the preaching of the word and the right administration of the sacraments. Calvin, Bullinger, Gomeris, Maastricht, Amark. These are all important Reformed theologians argued there are two marks. And then there are those who say there's really one mark of the church. It is the preaching of the gospel. Beza, Bannerman argues for this. What problems are attendant with each of these views. Well, if you're down here, it might seem too little. Don't we need discipline of the church? If the church doesn't have boundaries, uh, what do we really have a thing? Up here, you may say, well, this, this seems too, too much. The, so the the right exercise of the sacraments. So how right do they have to be? Most Baptists and Presbyterians want to say that each other are, have true churches. Or do you want to, I'm asking these as not rhetorical questions, but genuine questions. Do we want to de-church Quakers, Salvation Army, don't exercise sacraments? What about the vast majority of churches in America that probably don't practice church membership in any meaningful way? Probably don't practice church discipline? Just guessing the vast majority of churches here, the people there have never seen or heard of a discipline case in their congregation. I'm not saying they're unimportant, just th those are the sort of questions we land, however we land, we say, okay, so what, what does that mean? Is it enough to say that a church has in its official statement a belief in sacraments and discipline, even if it doesn't practice them? Down here, those who argue for, say, one mark, say the other two are subordinate to the first. Sacraments are implied. They're a sign of the gospel. Discipline declares one to be in line or out of step with the gospel. You could argue that sacraments and discipline are given for the church, but the church was given 
for the proclamation of the truth. So back to that Bannerman distinction, if you say the essence of the church is what the church was instituted for, that the church was instituted for the proclamation of the truth, preaching, teaching, communication of the word. If you don't have that, you don't have what the church is here for, where you could argue sacraments and discipline are instituted for the church to maintain its health and its purity. Bannerman argues that Presbyterians differ from Anglicans on this point, the latter making the sacraments of the essence of the church. So interesting that Bannerman in the 19th century would go to that point. He compares Westminster Confession of Faith 25-2, 39 Articles, Article 19. His argument is the Anglicans make sacraments of the essence of the church, which he thinks can lead to a dead outward formalism. And so he wants to somewhat put sacraments subordinate to the preaching of the gospel. Well, when in doubt, if you're having trouble, you can go first to the Bible, then to Turretin. <laughs> Turretin argued that whether we have one mark or three, the underlying point is the same. Quote, and this is quoted in Bannerman, at the foremost level of necessity is the pure preaching and profession of the word, inasmuch as there can be no church without it. But the same level of necessity is not possessed by the administration of the sacraments, which so depends on the former that it can still be temporarily absent, as can be seen in the Israelite church in the desert, which was without circumcision. The same principle applies to discipline, which applies to maintaining the position of the church. But where it is removed or corrupted, the church is not immediately done away with. Well, that's a remarkable bit of flexibility that Turretin has there. Without denying the sacraments and discipline as marks of the church, he's saying you know, the church can exist for a time with, without these. It cannot exist without the preaching of the gospel, without the pure preaching and profession of the word. Of course, it raises immediately what to make of the Catholic church. Do you take the Catholic Church as historic orthodoxy that they confess the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed and the Apostles' Creed as therefore being in some sense a true church, or because they have so vitiated the gospel, their understanding of justification it is not at all a true church, or might it depend upon local parishes, what a priest may teach or believe, Certainly in its formal doctrine, the reformers argued, and I think rightly, that the gospel is fundamentally compromised. To say a little bit more about these positions, or at least about these three marks, the right preaching of the word, we can see in many different texts, John 8, 31, abide in my word. John 8, 47, whoever is of God hears the word of God. John 14, 23, if you love me, you keep my word. 1 John 4, test the spirits, see who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. 2 John 9, whoever does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. So fundamentally, if you are not abiding in the word, you are not of God. The church must be a pillar and buttress of the truth. It doesn't mean preaching has to be perfect, for which all of us preachers past and or present and future can be thankful for. But if the fundamental articles of the faith are denied or never proclaimed, then the church has ceased to be a pillar of the truth and is no longer true to its own essence and nature. So right preaching of the word, second, right administration of the sacraments. This follows in close connection to the preaching of the word. If the preaching is the gospel made audible, the sacraments are the gospel made visible. It's told in the Great Commission to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Acts 2.42, they devote themselves to the breaking of bread. If, as most think, that's a reference to the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul presumes that when you come together, you are celebrating this. So it's certainly not optional. Then the right exercise of discipline. There is no there unless there is clearly something out there. I remember reading years ago, I can't remember the title of it, but... It was written by a, a more of an 
a mainline liberal author, and yet, and I think it was a she, was arguing, sort of cutting against the grain of her own tradition, look, if, if we don't have boundaries, we don't have a thing. That is, if you just talk about we're welcoming and we're inclusive and we're affirming and you can all come, well, what are you coming to? If, if, if there's, we don't, we get uncomfortable with outsiders and insiders and us and them and you're not a part and you are, but if you can't welcome someone to your home if you don't have a home, you can welcome someone to come hang out with you somewhere. But if you say, I want you to be a part of my family, well, if your family is the planet, they're already a part of your family. <laughs> you say, I want you to be a part of my family because my, the, the, the space of my family is not infinite. It's constrained. It has limits. It has boundaries. So by necessity, you need discipline. You need some sort of boundaries. You cannot say, come be a part of us if there's not, by contrast, a not us. You can't be welcoming if you don't have fences. You can't invite someone in if you don't have doors. We see throughout the New Testament, and we'll come back at the end of the course to talk about discipline, but Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, Revelation 2, some hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, or you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Those people were outside of the pale. You need boundaries. And then finally, and we'll take a break, the members of the church. The members of the church. This will be dealt with later in the class as well. The question is not who are the members of the invisible church that consists of the whole number of the elect. We want to consider the members of the visible church. Here's how Westminster Confession 25.2 puts it. The visible church consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion, semicolon, and of their children. Oh, that semicolon. And of their children. So the visible church consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion. So the confession says, first of all, it's made up of those that profess the true religion. That means it's not, that sounds very obvious, but think of what that is saying and, and what, it, what else it could be saying. So to say it's made of those who profess the true religion means that mere outward conformity to church authority and a sacramental system is not enough to be counted a member of the visible church, at least thinking here about adults, and then it adds the, the children. So that means you, you, don't, you don't profess anything, you don't believe, but you, you go twice a year and you receive, and you go Christmas needs, or you get... You go to Mass, you get the ritual done, you partake of something. Now, the confession's saying you need more than that. Uh, and we'll talk much more about the establishment principle and the voluntary principle. So certainly some of the Westminster divines uh, would have assumed that there would be a, a church establishment. So this doesn't mean that you couldn't have an established church but it does mean that you aren't a member of the visible church without a profession. You, you might still be you know, in some parish system where you need to be cared for and brought in, but to be truly a member of the visible church, thinking of adults here, you must profess. But notice, on the other hand, what it doesn't say. The confession makes the line of membership here a right profession rather than regeneration per se. This has come to with Bannerman as well. Of course, we don't want hypocrites and nominal Christians to feel falsely self-assured by membership in the church. And yet the confession recognizes that determining inner conviction and experience is extremely Difficult. We are more competent to judge what can be seen and heard instead of the invisible realities 
of the heart. Adult church members must make an intelligent profession of faith that is not contradicted by their conduct or character. So there is a little difference. Would we say we want regenerate church membership? I hope Presbyterians would say, yes, we want our adults to be regenerate. But the confession stops a little short of saying we can we can really confidently, or we're supposed to be determining regeneration. What we can determine is whether someone professes, understands the faith. There's also differences, <clears throat> I'm thinking about membership, between the Presbyterian tradition and the Dutch Reformed tradition. Dutch Reformed churches have often insisted on subscription to the doctrinal standards for membership. So in the PCA, I'm sure it must be this way in the ARP, OPC, uh, members come into the church and must understand the the Westminster standards. But I can tell you, we we have all sorts of uh, people who come in as members who aren't quite convinced about infant baptism, for example. In the, the Dutch tradition, like the URCNA, for example, you have to subscribe as a member to the standards. In fact, when, when our church, 2015, was going from the RCA, which is Dutch Reformed tradition, but it was mainline and more liberal, so they didn't, they didn't even make the officers subscribe to the standards, let alone the members. But we were looking at what denomination should we go to. Obviously, we went to the PCA, but Our first inclination was to go to the URCNA, United Reformed Churches of North America. They broke away from the CRC, the Christian Reformed Church, which had broken away from the RCA back in the 19th century. But the URC, so that would be Bob Godfrey, Mike Horton, people like that. There's a lot of connections out there with Westminster West. So we talked to some of their leaders because that made sense because we had the three forms of unity, Heidelberg, Belgic, Canons of Dort were our standards, and so it made sense to go into another denomination. But <clears throat> it was so hard for us, they said, well, we, all, of, all of your church members would need to subscribe to the, the three f- forms. I said, well, uh, well, that's a great goal. We have, we have some of our members aren't all the way there on five-point Calvinism we got a bunch of members that aren't quite convinced about infant baptism. They said, that's no problem. What we recommend you do is you can come in and you can just put them under discipline until they get that. <laughs> like, that's going to be a non-starter for <laughs> coming into the denomination. Um, <clears throat> I did have a, a brother uh, from the URCNA communicate with me that there is some language of distinction between officers and members in terms of your level of understanding and profession. But the, the basic distinction still holds that members need to affirm the standards. In Roman Catholicism, outward conformity to church authority in the sacramental system. But it makes sense that if the essence of a true church is right preaching, whether you have three, two, or one, everyone reformed agrees, the essence of the true church is the right preaching of the gospel, then it stands to reason that the one thing required for entry into the visible church should be a profession of faith in that true gospel. So we don't want mere outward conformity to church ordinances. We don't want to let people in who have less than that. We don't want to keep people out, I would argue. If this is the essence of the church, say, well, you adult member, can you profess, and you're not contradicting with your life, this proclamation of the gospel. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think I can finish this up and uh, then give you a break. Just come back to this question because when I first read Bannerman, I did, I, I did a double take because I thought, well, surely we want regenerate church membership. And, let, and yet, if you get to that section, Bannerman argues against this principle, which he sees as belonging to the independents and the congregationalists. He insists the proper requirement is not saving faith per se, but an intelligent profession not contradicted by one's content, conduct, and character. Uh, 
not sure I agree with Bannerman, but here's his argument. He says, we must not confuse invisible and visible church. You, you, you can't infallibly determine someone's invisible spiritual state, but you can get their outward profession and life. He also argues covenants are always pertaining to, to outward life. And there is an inward element that we also want to be true, but it is structured around those outer principles. So he looks at various scriptural metaphors. There's a house in which some vessels are for honor and some for dishonor, a wedding supper where some have a garment and others don't. There's a flock that has sheep and goats. Uh, if I can be so bold as to disagree with Bannerman, I, I think he was so assuming an established church context in 19th century Scotland where everyone was some kind of member of the church that I think he misappropriated some of those texts of sheep and goats. Well, yes, we, we, some of those are about the world, though, not the church. Even if you think vessels for honorable use, vessels for dishonorable use, surely we don't want to just allow that that's a, a reality. It, it may be, but that's not our, our goal. And so I think there was such an assumption of the established church principle that led him to be a little softer on that because it's one thing to say, okay, church member, I, I'm not sure you really, you don't have a, a story of a, an experience with Christ or being moved by Christ, but can you confess this? Yep, we can. Uh, all right, and your life doesn't look any different. Okay, you're a member. So I would want to push back against it and see a little bit more value in trying to, trying to determine regenerate church membership. At the same time, I understand Bannerman's point that we, we can't determine what's in someone's heart. We have to judge what we see and what we hear. Do they have a corresponding character? And there is a certain default that we're not even aware of on the other side of the Great Awakening as evangelicals that we tend to think, hey, you ought to be able to give me your story. I mean, we do this every time someone joins. Okay, tell us how you became a Christian. We, we do sort of expect as evangelicals, even if you didn't have a dramatic conversion, you have some kind of personal testimony. Uh, and I think that's helpful for the most part, as long as we realize that is a relatively recent innovation in the history of the church. Not a personal, but, but that kind of language that you ought to have a personal testimony. Certainly we want people all throughout history to have a personal relationship with Jesus, but some of this is our own evangelical language and evangelical context. And to that degree, I think Bannerman can at least warn us against a kind of over-scrupulosity. Brother, sister, I, I need to hear a little bit more angst in your, your gospel story. Or I, need, I need to get more of your conversion experience. Uh, this, this came home to me in my first church 20 years ago in Northwest Iowa, and I did a lot of pastoral calling, and I'd visit older folks in the hospital, shut-ins, nursing home. And I realized quickly I had a certain vocabulary growing up as, as I did in, you know, evangelical youth group and conferences and retreats and just all. And I'd ask people things about, tell me, what's your personal walk with Jesus like? And these 85-year-old Dutch people were like, I, they didn't. And at first I was really taken aback. I, all these we got a lot of non-Christian old people in this church, maybe. But I think a lot of it was, was a, a difference in categories and language. It didn't grow up with the same kind of vocabulary to talk. You know, it didn't grow up in accountability groups and in small group Bible studies. My, my grandparents were like that. It just they didn't have the categories if you ask them. 
well, how's your walk with Jesus going? How's your personal relationship? What, what are you learning? It, it, this, but if you tried to ask them, you know, what do you believe? Uh, what, have you, what did you learn in the scriptures this week? They could give you questions. So Bannerman at least helps us come to grips with perhaps some of our own assumptions, even if I would argue he maybe wasn't aware of some of his own. The other question, of course, is about the members and their children. And uh, we'll just save that for a fun later time in the class. But Presbyterians, just men here going for ordination exams, just be ready. Someone says, who are the members of the church? Adults who profess faith and their children. Don't leave off and their children. It's our understanding that the, the new covenant, like the old covenant, though there are differences, still includes not only those who truly know the Lord, but also those who are their children. And we'll have much more to say about that later. So why don't you be back here? We did the long part of the class now. Coffee Chapel's at 1030, so you're going to come back here in seven minutes, and then we're going to go from 9.50 to 10.30. We come now to Lecture 3. You're taking notes, and this will take up these last 40 minutes and probably uh, most or all of next week. We're thinking about this very big, relevant question, the church and the state. What is the relationship between the two? A few of you have took my enlightenment course over the summer, and in large part, that's about the history of moral philosophy in the 17th and 18th century, which has a lot to do with how we understand church and state and natural law and natural rights. It'd just be a teeny overlap, but not nearly as much as we can talk about in that whole course. And certainly, uh, at all times, but especially in recent years, this is a very pertinent question, which is stirring up lots of discussions, sometimes light, sometimes more heat than light, on the proper relationship between church and state. We're just going to outline some of the distinctions here with the remainder of this course and follow very closely Bannerman's outline, summarizing his points, and then come around to think together about what we want to make of his distinctions and where we agree or disagree. When Christ returned to the Father in his ascension, the question was how his work of grace and salvation were to continue, primarily through the Holy Spirit, the Son's presence and gift to the world. But secondarily, the salvific mission of Christ, Bannerman says, was to continue through the church. So before we even come to church and state proper, I want us to think about the church in the world and thinking about the mission of the church in the world. I haven't taught pastoral ministry for a couple of years here, just for one reason or another. When I do, I have uh, an entire lecture on the mission of the church. Maybe some of you have read the book I wrote with Greg Gilbert, What is the Mission of the Church? So this is just a very abbreviated section on that question. Here's what Bannerman says. He makes three points about the mission of the church on earth. Number one, he says, quote, in the first place, the Christian church in reference to the world in which it is found is designed and fitted to be a witness for Christ and not a substitute for Christ. That's key, a witness to Christ, not a substitute for Christ. I sometimes say uh, it's a distinction between being avatars and ambassadors. So we all have heard of incarnational ministry, and to the degree that that simply means you inhabit a culture and you learn a language and you understand what makes people tick, uh, I get the term. And yet it's not the most helpful term because we there's one incarnation, son of the father, and we are not called to be avatars of Christ, but to be his ambassadors. That's the language in across the great commission texts in the Gospels and in Acts. Either you teach, you make disciples, or Luke, Acts in particular, you will be my 
witnesses. The church does not embody all the powers which belong to Christ. We do not minister as a substitute for an absent Christ. We're not ministering as a substitute for an absent Christ. We are pointing to him. The church does not assume his unique power and authority. Christ has not resigned his office and work as mediator. So you don't think of it as it is finished means Christ doesn't do anything anymore, sort of clocking out retirement spirit. Your turn now. Father created, son saved. Now he just watched and spirit does his thing and, and the church so that we're a substitute. Bannerman helpfully says we witness to Christ, but we don't want to think it's an absent Christ. Uh, think of that famous line at the beginning of Acts where Luke says in my previous book, Theophilus, I relayed to you all that Christ began to do and to teach. By implication, this second volume is what Christ continues to do and to teach. Acts is about the continuing work of Christ in the world. So a witness for Christ, not a substitute for Christ. Second point, Bannerman says, quote, In the second place, the Christian church in the world is an outward ordinance of God, fitted and designed to be the instrument of the Spirit, but not the substitute for the Spirit. So we're not a substitute for Christ as the church, and the church is not a substitute for the Spirit. The Spirit works through word and sacrament. God has committed to work through these ordinances as His means of grace, but the church is not a substitute for the Spirit. That means there is no automatic spiritual vitality simply by virtue of an external connection to the church and its ordinances. This is the, the, the flaw in a sacerdotal system, a sacramental system where the sacraments work ex opere operato by the working of the work, that just the, the ritual of the sacrament itself Get baptized, and you're joined to Christ, and you're justified. That's what baptism does. Rightly administered by a proper priest with the right formula, it does that. And then the, 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 it's not just that the Catholic Church has seven sacraments and Protestants have five. It's an entirely different system. Those sacraments there are working by their own work, spiritual efficacy in people as they receive them. Where the Reformers all said, faith is what makes the sacraments efficacious, and we'll come back to that. So the church is not a substitute for the Spirit, that if you just are connected to the ordinances of the church and the rituals of the church, spiritual stuff is happening. Maybe use this uh, little anecdote before, but when, when I was in seminary, they would sometimes lead over, you know, a reading week or a spring break. A couple of professors would take some students on a, what they call it, like a cultural immersion or a, a mission plunge and just somewhere you could drive to. So we were in New York, and we, or we were in Boston, drove down to New York, spent a few days there, and uh, ha had arranged to to visit with, I think we went to a, a Hindu temple, we went to a Sikh temple, remember who else we met with and uh, it was an opportunity for us to engage and see what, we, what other religions were doing and it was also then you know you you pitch it to those folks hey we got you know evangelical Christians who want oh great but we also then we get to share the gospel with them and so there was good ulterior motives but I, somehow you know most of us so we have some exceptions here but most of us who grew up in in the west don't see that kind of ritual system. And it was eye-opening to me in a, in a Sikh temple to see all of the, and they, you know, let us, you know, sort of an outside edge, just, just watch in. And to just see stations of, of young men who looked to be 20 years old, they obviously had not gone through RTS, and uh, they, they were clearly just doing a ritual just ablutions or incense or some kind of ritual performance. So people came in and just had a ritual 
to perform. And so these men didn't look like they were particularly interested in what they were doing. There was no teaching component. It was just doing the ritual. There are, uh, I, you know, I've seen videos of Tibetan Buddhists with their prayer wheels and put little prayers in these wheels and they'll have just a rows of dozens of them and just go by and they have handles and you just spin them and as they spin around each rotation is a prayer it's just it's a it's a ritual that works spiritual vitality we always want to be very careful that is not what we believe about the church or the sacraments it's not a ritual that you just do and therefore imparts this life. We're not a substitute for the spirit. In the third place, here's Bannerman's third point, the Christian church in the world is fitted and designed to serve as a means for affecting the communion of Christians with each other, not to be a substitute for the communion of Christians with their Savior. So you see the three things he's saying. His first point the church is not a substitute for Christ. Third, or second, the church is not a substitute for the Spirit. And then third, the church is not a substitute for communion with, with Christ. We are affecting communion with each other, that is true. But the goal is not simply to belong to something. The goal is that we are people who belong to Christ and therefore belong to each other. It's not just it's not a, a social organization, it's not a club. It is in relation to Christ himself. Bannerman says there is great advantage to being what he calls a social Christian rather than an individual Christian. As we have a relationship to the church and through the church, a relationship with other Christians, but not in substitute for a relationship with Christ himself. Turn to 1 John for a moment. I just love how John puts it. First John 1, you hear the echoes, the same kind of vocabulary and language of John's gospel. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. We are telling to the world, yes, we want you to have fellowship with us, but not, not as... Uh, a mere social organization or club for mutual support and strengthening, but because indeed our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. This is why we do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing Hebrews 10, because in the church and only in the church do we have fellowship with the Father and His Son, and you get to have fellowship with other people who also have fellowship with the Father and the Son. Now, yes, it doesn't always feel that way. I was just listening sometimes uh, in the car, listening to different sermons. I was listening, and one of the people I like listening to is Alistair Begg. I was listening to his sermon last week, and he was talking about the church. And he said, yeah, the church is your family, and you know what families are like. You didn't choose your family. You don't always get along with your family. Uh, but you love your family, and so you do with, with the church. You, you may more immediately feel like you have more in common with you know, the people that root for the same sports team or the people that live in the same part of town or the people who went to the same school or have the same background, and that's easy. But only with Christians do we have this shared fellowship with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ, which is why he says in verse 4, we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And notice, it doesn't say your joy. I know, manus some manuscripts say your. Well, uh, your is kind of implied. You're going to be part of us. But our, it would give us such joy for you to enjoy with us the fellowship of the Father 
and of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what sort of institution and organization the church is. Well, if Bannerman's correct, that the church is, is a witness to Christ, not a substitute for Christ, it is an instrument of the Spirit, but not a substitute for the Spirit. It affects communion with one another, but not as a substitute for communion with Christ. That helps us think more clearly about what the mission of the church is. Uh, again, I, I, have, I have a whole book on this, so let me try to give you five, ten minutes here on the mission of the church, because this will be one of the most important questions you have to answer, especially those uh, who will be pastors and be responsible for making hard decisions in the church. When we say what is the mission of the church, both of those words are important. So mission. The question is not what is everything the church should do in obedience to Christ? Sometimes people say, well, the, the mission of the church is great commandment, great commission. Well, no one who's a Christian is against the great commandment and the great commission. And yes, the church must do both. But we're not just asking the question, what do we do in obedience to Christ? Mission has a more specific word than that. And yes, a mission is not in our English Bibles, but it comes from the Latin word mitere, meaning to be sent out. When you are dismissed in 24 minutes, you are sent out. So a mission is what people are sent to accomplish. Not simply everything we do in obedience to Christ, there is a sent component, of course, related to, there are two L's in that, uh, apostolane, that's the Greek word to be sent out, which appears, I forgot to write it down, if it's uh, nearly a hundred times or more in the New Testament, both as apostles and as sent out ones and to send people out. So mission is thinking about what, what, what is the church sent to accomplish? And actually, if you want to be more technical, the church itself is not referred to as the sent. The church is gathered. The church then sends out into the world to accomplish a certain mission. So uh, it raises the question, is every member a missionary? I like to be persnickety and fastidious and grumpy about these things. So I've tried to explain uh, to our mission folks at Christ Covenant that I don't think that's, I understand what people mean. Every member a missionary. You all have a role to play in the Great Commission, yes. We all ought to be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. We all should pray for opportunities to speak of Christ to our neighbors. But missionary, as someone who is sent out, I think the New Testament would have us reserve for a particular class of people, a particular person who is sent out across a culture to speak the message of the gospel. So in that sense... It's not even that the church itself is sent, but that from the church, there are those who are sent out to help fulfill the mission of the church. So mission, we're not saying everything that you do in your life to be salt and light in the world, but the church. So that second word is important too. We're not just saying what might your particular calling as a Christian be, but the church as this organism and organization that has elders and officers and sacraments and the marks and what what is the church so there's a lot of good things that christians are going to do in the world that don't show up anywhere on the church budget that aren't a part of the mission of the church and i understand that's hard for people to hear because they think i want but i want the church to value what i do and 
in the workplace during the week. Well, yes, there is value. And not just because you make money and give to the church or because you evangelize, that's important. There's value in what you do excellently to the Lord, value in culture building and culture shaping, all of that. But everything that has value cannot be brought under the auspices of the church or the mission of the church. One of the points I stress in pastoral ministry class is that pastors, it's one of the hardest things about being a pastor, is you have to be no people, N-O people. And none, okay, a few of you like that, and then maybe you should think if you're doing the right thing. But <laughs> most of us, we are not getting into, we, we are yes people. Yes, I want to help you. Yes, I want to show up at the hospital. Yes, I want to pray with you. Yes, I want to read the Bible with you. Yes, I want to teach you about Jesus. But you have to also be no people, meaning people are going to come with a lot of good ideas, good plans. They're not simple. I mean, it's not, Pastor, I was wondering, should we evangelize the neighborhood or firebomb the neighborhood? What do you think? They're not clear. They're good things. But you have to be prepared to say no to good things that aren't the actual mission of the church. And it's really hard when someone says, I got my niece, she's doing this, this great painting ministry and God is a God of, of art and creativity. And I would say, that's really, really cool. And uh, are people being led to faith in Christ? Are they being discipled? Well, no, but it's, it provides a lot of good opportunities for people. That's wonderful. And maybe some individuals in our church would want to support you in that. Uh, but as a ministry of the church, we have to be constrained by what the mission is. One of the just questions I have in the back of my head is, is this good thing? that someone would like the church to do. If the church doesn't do it, will anyone else do it? It's not a foolproof question, but usually it gets you toward the right answer. If you can go, you know what? If the church of Jesus Christ doesn't do this, a lot of other people will, will probably do it. Lower unemployment, plant trees, build a park, uh, even political advocacy, art, movies, a lot. If the church doesn't do it, there are other people who are going to do it. But no one except the church of Jesus Christ is going to evangelize people with the gospel, disciple the nations, and plant churches. So the mission of the church must be constrained by those things which lead people to Christ and build up and establish the church so, of course, we want to avoid defining the mission of the church so small that we only think conversion is what matters. There are some people that that's it. Just go in as fast as you can. Get decisions. Of course, the Great Commission does not say make decisions for Christ. Make disciples of Christ. Uh, Acts 14. Just turn there for a moment. If you've been around any of my classes or the church, you've maybe seen me go to this text. I think this is the clearest text laying out. You can use this text with a missions committee. Here's what we're doing. Acts chapter 14, verse 19. So here's Paul on his missionary journey. If anyone is to give us an indication of what missionaries do, it's the Apostle Paul. And here we get a summary but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul. Okay, that's, that may happen or not. Dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up, entered the city, and on the next day he went with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, in saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And they passed through Pisidia, came to Pamphylia, 
When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the, the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door for faith of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. You remember, they were sent out from Antioch, they come full circle, they're back at Antioch, and they gathered the church together, and they declared all that God had done with them. So I imagine this is Missions Week at the First Presbyterian, First Baptist Church of Antioch, and they come, guys, Paul's back, Barnabas is back, let's hear about their work, and they got the PowerPoint up there, and they're talking about what they do. So they're giving a picture. What do missionaries do? Paul is going to exemplify the mission of the church. And what are the sort of things he would have shared? Well, just what we read in the verses before. And you notice very clearly a three-legged stool. Verse 21, they preached the gospel, made disciples. So there's an evangelism, not just decisions, but discipling. So there's kind of a personal evangelism, discipleship. And then strengthening the souls of the disciples. So I do think mission must be broad enough to have a strengthening component. And you see this in Paul's missionary journeys. Doesn't he then circle back to churches that he planted? And his letters as a missionary are to churches where he's trying to strengthen them. He's trying to make sure they're established in the faith, they're able to be self-supporting and they defend the truth, strengthening. And then, verse 23, when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Church planting, establishing elders. So at, at Christ's covenant, we look at our, our missions budget and it's not that we have a rigid, it has to go in equal thirds, but we look at church planting, church strengthening, and then evangelism, personal evangelism, discipleship. And you can't always separate those three. You hope not to, but that's what we're looking at. So are, are you helping to plant a church? Uh, maybe you're not the one planting, but you're the one doing the, the pioneering evangelism. We don't want that to be separate. from. We don't want people to just go in throw up a curtain, throw the Jesus film. Hey, you became a Christian. Woo, right back to prayer letter. No, you, you haven't then made disciples. You haven't established a church. And then we also, with the strengthening component, that's why we'll support teaching ministries, seminaries overseas, things that are strengthening the church there that still needs resources and, and help from the West in order to be strengthened. You might say, well, what does this leave for maybe mercy ministry, or what we sometimes call diaconal sort of ministry. We do have that as a fourth component of our mission budget, uh, but we always want to think with that, how is this mercy ministry category helping to feed into these other three? So if it's supporting a crisis pregnancy center, is it a, a Christian organization that in addition to saving unborn lives. They're trying to have conversations where they can talk about their Christian faith. If it's doing some sort of uh, you know, relief work, you're going to give money to help with relief in Turkey and Syria. Is it helping existing churches and Christians there who are on the ground providing tangible relief and are also able to have conversations and communication and be a witness to Christ in the gospel. So we want that mercy ministry diaconal component to, to not be disconnected from what we see here as the mission of the church. So we don't want to make the mission of the church so narrow that it's just get conversions, and we don't want to make it so broad. When mission is everything, mission ends up being nothing. If digging wells, medical centers, great schools, better crop yields, if all of that, that, that is all can be an expression of Christian love, and we ought not make apologies for Christians wanting to do those things. We simply have to ask, is this the mission? Is this what we see Paul 
and his associates going out to do. And you might say, well, you don't understand the great needs we have. Well, uh, I'm sure I, I don't fully, but they had just as many great needs. They were much more impoverished, had much less access to clean water and medical care in the first century than most people would today. I remember one time, uh, I wasn't in, in India, I haven't been there, but it was speaking somewhere overseas and an Indian brother came up and it was helpful. I, I was giving this kind of mission of the church talk and, and I left a little clause like, you know, it, of course, when there's dire emergencies or extreme need, you know, you, you may have to, I don't know, deviate from this or something. I was just trying to give a little es escape hatch. And of all people, this brother came up and he just said, I understand what you're trying to say, but you realize where I'm in India, that's everywhere. There's extreme needs everywhere. You may be thinking like if a tornado comes through Matthews, you got to help with the tornado rebuild. But if we stepped away from the mission of the church to meet the extreme needs around us, we would never come back to the mission of the church. Now, of course, as Christians, some of them are doctors or nurses and they're or they work with NGOs, or they're agronomists, and they're doing all those sorts of things. We're talking about as the church. So I used to say, this is sort of a dated example, uh, but I used to say, if, if Oprah and Bono are doing it, let's not do it. Uh, just because they were kind of the you know, quintessential, maybe 15 years ago, doing good in the world. Okay, good, if they do good in the world. We would need to be doing the things that if the church of Jesus Christ doesn't do it, no one else will do it. Along with this, uh, and we're, so we're, not, we're coming to church and state, let me just say a little bit more then about this relationship because this helps to explain the mission of the church. What is the church on earth? How many of you uh, have followed some of the the online debate uh, with Stephen Wolf's book on the case for Christian nationalism. You sort of follow that. Any of you read my 21-page review of that? Or listen to the... Oh, did I record this? No. Uh, okay, well, well, good on you. So uh, if you don't know about this, this book, uh, he's a Presbyterian. I don't know what church he goes to. I think he lives in North Carolina and uh, wrote the book, that came out at the end of last year, the case for Christian nationalism. I have a very long, you can Google and find it, uh, where I try to sympathize with what is animating his concerns, but if you've read it, you know that I'm quite critical of the book. And just a, a, a f one point in particular, as he's relating to the role of the church, one of my criticisms of many is that I think there is a truncated appreciation for what the church is on earth and an exaggerated sense for what the nation is supposed to be on earth. So Wolf is actually quite good about the mission of the church and not confusing the spiritual kingdom uh, of Christ through the church and the church's ministry with an earthly kingdom. He does not conflate the church in the world, but argues that the Christian nation, to use his language, is the complete image of eternal life on earth. And so he's very critical of the idea. Uh, I don't know that he would have me in his sights, but I've said this thing, so have others, many times. He's critical of the idea that the church is a kind of colony or outpost of heaven. He sees rather that it's the Christian nation which gives the complete image of heavenly life. So to quote, in addition to being a worshiping people, the Christian nation has submitted to magistrates and constitutes a people whose cultural practices and self-conception provide a foretaste of heaven. So a Christian nation, quote, should be ordered to make the earthly city an analog of the heavenly city. It's very essential to his argument that the Christian nation 
The earthly Christian nation is the analog to the heavenly city. And with that gives a very wide compass to what the nation is supposed to be. And, I argue, gives a much truncated view of, therefore, what the church is. So that I think the role of the church is greatly diminished and the importance of the state and of the nation is greatly increased. I just want to put to you why I think it's helpful to think of the church as an embassy, a colony, an outpost of heaven or of the kingdom. I find this one of the really helpful ways to orient our understanding of the church and I think prevents a lot of bad ideas both on the Christian nationalism side of things and on the social justice side of things to think about the church as this embassy. What what is an embassy? You understand the concept. Uh, If you are in France and you go to the American embassy, it's for people who are in a a different land, but their citizenship is somewhere else. So the embassy helps you get your passport, helps you deal with problematic French people. I don't know. It, it, it's there, and they want to be good neighbors. They don't want to be kicked out of France. They understand they're in a... But that embassy has its ultimate allegiance to another place. Their ultimate allegiance is to the interest of America and Americans, not to France. And so they're trying to help you. It's an, it's an embassy, it's an outpost in a foreign land of another country. That's what the church is. It's in a strange place, trying to be good neighbors in the place. And you know, Jeremiah, as they're in exile, I want you to get married. I want you to Be good citizens in Babylon. I want you to pray for the peace of the city because this is where you live. If you're an embassy in American embassy in France, you don't want France to be pulverized. You're there. So you're there. But the outpost, the embassy, the colony that is the church, it, it operates according to heavenly values. Its ultimate aim is for a different citizenry. Because we know that though we're citizens of an earthly nation or kingdom, our ultimate allegiance is to a heavenly city. I think this makes sense of the sweep of redemptive history. The heavenly paradise is first found in Eden, and then that Edenic bliss is there in the nation of Israel, because Israel is... Eden is where God dwells, then they're kicked out of Eden. Then Israel is where God dwells. It's described with Edenic language. The boundaries sound like Eden. The the, the cubic nature of the Holy of Holies is like the cubic dimensions that we'll come to in Revelation. So God dwells there. And the, the, the Levites act as a kind of guardians of God's presence around the tabernacle, just like the cherubim did in Eden. There are judicial punishments there in Israel, which we know get recalibrated to the church. So put outside the camp, uh, execution in Israel, those same verses Paul uses to talk about excommunication in the church. So we're seeing that the church is taking on now those kinds of qualities. So when Acts tells us that they, they shared and had every, and no one was in want, no one lacked anything, that's not a prescription for a certain social services plan. That's saying the church is supposed to reflect some of that Edenic bounty and plenty. Just as there was no want, there was no deprivation So as much as we can in the church, we're so sharing with one another that we enjoy that. And excommunication, therefore, becomes like banishment from the Garden of Eden, like exile from the promised land. Then you're disfellowshipped, you're put outside the church. 
The kingdom, therefore, is where the king and his people are. The kingdom is not code for you know, lo, uh, well, it's, it's, it's code for heaven on earth, but it's heaven on earth in the church. And we're not to expect that the kingdom exists where the king is not worshipped. So sometimes people talk about, you know, we're, we're planting these trees or we're recycling or even we're getting our candidates elected. We're bringing the kingdom. Now, the kingdom is that heaven, that Edenic paradise breaking in here on earth and where that manifests itself is in the church. The new Jerusalem is the vision of the bride, the wife of the lamb, the church. Hebrews describes the church as Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. That is not the description for the nation state. So, I find it very hard to conclude that the church is somehow an incomplete image of heaven. And then the nation is meant to be the complete image of heaven. Now, the complete image of heaven here on earth is the work and the ministry of the church, which helps us, and here we're closing, helps us to think more clearly about what the mission of the church is and what we're trying to accomplish it prevents a kind of over-realized eschatology, a kind of utopianism. Uh, people like the phrase, because we all like Latin phrases which are obvious and yet feel kind of cool saying them. Missio Dei, mission of God. Imago Dei, maybe heard of it. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. So we like those Latin phrases. Great phrase, mission of God. The mission of the church is not identical with the mission of God. The mission of God is the total renovation and renewal of all things. Yes. Amen. Does that mean, therefore, the church's mission, as you often hear, is to partner with God in the total renewal of all things? You'll hear that. You'll, you'll read that on many PCA websites. It's a partner with God in the total renewal of all things. Well, the word partner is key. We bear witness to the one who will bring about the total renewal of all things. And there's a disconnect because when people say we partner with God to redeem the city or bring shalom or, and they mean something other than the church, they usually think, therefore, that's why we're going to bring heaven to our city and we're going to lower unemployment and we're going to provide the, the resources and the infrastructure, and we're going to do these things to, to heal. Okay, because that's heaven on earth. We well, you know what part of the vision of the, the new heavens and new earth is? It's also the wicked cast into the lake of fire. That never makes it into the, the <laughs> website that we're going to partner. When, when we talk about God in the renewal of all things, he's also casting the wicked into the lake of fire. But we instinctively realize, let's leave that one for God to do when he comes back. So yes, we bear witness to what God will do, but we are not partnering with God. We are declaring what God will do. This comes back to we're, we're not avatars, we're ambassadors. We bear witness to the work of God. We bear witness to Christ and by the Spirit and the Word, what he accomplishes through us but not partners in the renewal of all things, rather to stick to what task he has given to the church in this age. And we see it there in Acts. We will come back. All of that is preliminary to get to the church and the state. So enjoy your coffee chapel. See you 830 next week.